Thank you very much. Kindly introduce. Just kindly introduce. I am Lee Hun Sang. He made a right point in terms of introduction of me. I've been working on infectious diseases, but regarding disaster, um, I don't think I've been thinking of the connection between digester and infectious diseases, to be honest. But those who have been working in healthcare systems and service base may not be really familiar with this connection between the two. For example, cube frameworks, send aid frameworks uh, were not really um, discussed by them. And I don't think many of those people are familiar with that concept. But I was really glad that I was offered this presentation around a decade ago at Johns Hopkins University. I studied and uh, I, I had a chance to be trained about um, help courses uh, developed by G Gilbert Jonam, Professor Gil Gilbert Jonam. Gilbert Bornam. Gilbert Bornam and other faculty members who are internationally well known developed that course at that time. Earthquake in IT was an issue. And people were very much attentive to natural disasters. So I was one of them who studied it. But now we are faced with this challenge of infectious disease, which is also part of disasters. Today I'm going to talk about WHO e emergency and disaster and risk management framework. This is called the Health EM BDMR. Speaking of it, I'm also going to touch upon the Korean situations and what we have to think further. Uh, when I say next, then you will turn it over to the next page. Okay. Currently, approximately 190 million people are directly affected annually by emergencies due to natural and technological hazards, and 77,000 people died because of that. And from 2012 to 2017, and even in 2018, we've seen over 350 infectious diseases events. I will go into more details later about this. And regarding digestive emergency and health, the morbidity and mortality have been increasing as we have experienced in Daegu in Korea, New York City in the United States, which is one of the iconic advanced countries and Italy have eyewitness how the public health care system can collapse. During Ebola, Sierra Leone saw 200 medical staff members died or got released in the process of treating patients. So this disease do not discriminate the countries, either advanced countries or developed countries or developing countries. What's important is that from the perspective of international workers, well, uh, you have to make sure, you have to understand that the patients of malaria was more than those who died of Ebola. Well, we have seen a dramatic decrease in workforces, including women and teenagers, and teenagers' pregnancy rate is highly likely to increase during this period of time. In this pandemic crisis, 
No country is safe. Any country can collapse due to both direct or indirect um, impacts. Well, in on the um, in the case of emergency, uh, it is essential to protect health, and WHO uh, plays a part in it and to attain UHC and to build the resilience of communities, countries, and health systems is also important where um, WHO works for. And for uh, uh, the, from the perspective of uh, risk management, um, the government has to safeguard um, development and implement local, national, regional, and global strategies in health and other sectors, and also IHR and Sendai framework and others uh, should be also taken into account in implementing SDGs. And uh, before talking about health ADRM, WHO also has a, a framework which is called the Emergency Response Framework. In terms of emergency response, you may not think WHO first, but WHO also has a part to play here. Um, and they have this to serve those in need in crisis. And as for the health clusters, WHO also has obligations to the Interagency Standing Committee as health cluster lead agency to the international health regulations and to other international councils. And under the WHO's obligations, I mean WHO's obligations are under the international health regulations. They're supposed to provide information censure to each country and they also um, determine whether particular events constitute a public health emergency of international concern with advice from external experts. And what kind of responses are needed um, should be also determined by them based on the expert advice. And regarding the commitments of WHO in emergency response, um, here are the cores. Um, the evidence-based approach is very essential. Resources are limited. We can't really call for every supply that is needed. We have to think about what's the most effective Beyond just the treating patients, we have to think about demography data and uh, relative situations to prevent situations from being exacerbated. So we have to develop an evidence-based health sector response strategy plan and appeal. And we also have to ensure that adaptive disease surveillance and early warning and response systems are in place and we provide up-to-date information on the health situation health sector performance and promote and monitor the application of standards and best practices and provide um, technical expertise and support. And regarding this emergency response framework, we have uh, three grades. And the grade one is pretty much in, uh, grade zero is a normal situation, normal level. And one and two and three are um, abnormal situations. And depending on which grade the situation is placed in, um, you have to determine um, the measures and actions to be taken. And also, 
WHO has to provide leadership and coordination of the health sector and cost response. Also, logistics and to make logistics and office establishment work. WHO has to coordinate core services, diagnosis kit and uh, essential medical supplies. Uh, should be provided to Africa under the pre framework of common supply framework uh, developed by WHO. The common procurement framework applies to the countries in the African countries, so it is provided at a reasonable price. So WHO provides a variety of core services. <coughs> And coming back to the EDRM, <coughs> health emergency and digestive risk management, what we have to do? That's a question to answer. So we have to systematically analyze and manage health risks. For example, hazard exposure and vulnerable reduction to prevent and mitigate risks and preparedness is also important as well as response and recovery. These are all elements that should be taken into account. Well, in this situation, like a global pandemic or any disasters, the government has been emphasizing responses. In case of disasters, what I have been thinking too is that preparedness may be more important than response in responding to digesters or um, digester reductions. What we can say about our accomplishment in Korea is that we have been quite prepared over the past years. I mean, what we have done uh, over the past eight years may be more important in talking about accomplishment of in Korea digesters and this, these digesters will come back. Well, we may have to be prepared for even more severe uh, one than COVID-19. Well, thinking of that, we have to be prepared. How we can improve preparedness? So the digestive management framework uh, provides a common language and comprehensive approach, very inclusive and integrated approaches um, that applies across sectors. But we have to focus not only on digesters, but also for, but also on healthcare systems. How can we improve healthcare systems as a whole? and low and high income countries um, both have to pay attention to that. We also have to efficiently and effectively communicate to mitigate risks, preparedness, prevention, readiness, response and recovery. The, this whole process um, should be responded properly under this framework. Uh, like I said earlier, The next slide. Like I said earlier, in the health EDR, um, we have an emphasized and proactive approach before something happens. How we can prepare ourselves and prevention and mitigation are very Im important. And. Um, to, for prevention and mitigation, so we have to take different approaches. And at the same time, we have to improve and build up the capacity of government and municipalities and local communities. And at the same time, resilience, resilient health system should be an integral part of this effort. Well, um, rather than high tech medical supplies, or rather the primary medical services that based on local communities 
should work and how we can protect uh, medical facilities and in terms of responses how we can scale up these services so that these supplies and these services can apply across the nation should be the um, should be the question that we have to answer and the healthy EDRM is about how to create digestive risk reduction, humanitarian action, climate change, and sustainable development um, are all applied. Um, a risk management, emergency management, epidemic preparedness and response, and health system strengthening are also uh, very um, should also should all be taken into account. So that we can make sure, like I said, health security, digestive risk reduction, humanitarian action, climate change, and sustainable development. So the goal of this document is that rather than replacing the existing framework, um, this uh, suggests um, as a uh, policy guideline, this suggests uh, the way forward, I mean, what we have to do in the future, same day framework, SDGs, and the Paris Agreement, are all the existing framework, and how we can um, um, bring about a synergy effect with these agreements is, is something um, that this highlights. So based on the concerns and insights that we have earned from the existing ones, including same day framework, uh, we have to establish a D1, which is not that much different. I mean, which, is, which um, takes into account all the past frameworks and policies. But this framework, this new framework, uh, focuses on health. Now, so let me skip the end day part, uh, which will be presented later. Uh, the most important parts in Sendai framework is this preparedness and response and recovery and reconstruction, the holistic approach and the concept of resilience and risk reduction and prevention are suggested here by at the uh, national and international level. And in terms of a healthy EDRM, again, uh, what we pursue is to change the approaches. So from event-based to risk-based, from reactive to proactive, from single hazard to all hazard, from hazard focus to vulnerability and capacity focus, <coughs> from single agency. For example, in Korea, what we have to pay attention to here in Korea is that the whole of government approach was taken. So the ministry level uh, cooperation um, was possible here in Korea. So to whole of society, something like that. So in health EDRM, risk-based approach, comprehensive emergency, emergency management, all hazard approach, inclusive, um, people and community-centered approach, which means um, multi-angle uh, approaches, multi-sectional and multi discipline approach, something like that. Are, are have been um, highlighted and country capacity needs uh, capacity of countries for prevention preparedness response and recovery remains extremely <coughs> variable how we can build up the capacity <coughs> how we can improve the weak healthcare system and the digital management systems and how we can solve the problem of limited access to that resources What's also important here is that we have to take multi-sectoral approaches for healthy DRM. And we also have to um, make full use of the capacities for implementing the existing IHR. And at the same time, we need to take an approach of healthy system building blocks. And also what's highlighted here in healthy DRM is that we also have to make an impact on education and poverty problem solving, um, which means uh, we have to build a partnership with uh, the sectors 
what you have been working on, pop to production, and so on and so forth. And this is um, health systems, primary health care, and community-based action. They all highlighted in developing adaptable and vigilant health care systems, risk assessment, and so evidence-based are all, all um, emphasized here. And um, to protect health in emergency, <coughs> um, we are thinking of that we have to take a certain approach. And for surge capacity, <coughs> healthcare systems need to prepare to cope with large numbers of patients, uh, particularly in Korea's hotspot, Daegu. Uh, we've learned we've learned a lesson. A dr drastic increase in infectious infected patients were a shock, and how we could respond to that, and that was about surge capacity, and that brings about importance. Um, that brings about an issue of importance of public health care system. Well, the Korean government has taken pride in um, everyday treatment center and clinic. Well, the private sector facilities and agency, government agency facilities were all used for COVID-19 patients with mild symptoms. and severely ill patients who were almost dying at home um, were quite avoided with such measures. And how we can set up policies and legislate this idea <coughs> and how we can procure financial support and resources. And risk communication is also important and has been emphasized in Korea as well and how we can deal with health infrastructure and logistics. In terms of policies in Korea, diagnosis kit was swiftly sent out to the hotspots. Emergency use, use authorization process was already prepared um, after the MERS. So we were able to use it. That was good. And that process is like this. Even without the approval of the Minister, the minister of Health and Welfare, um, if need, need be, we can, um, we can permit it to be used within almost uh, 15 years. I mean, even if it's a newly developed kit. So even within 15, month, uh, 15 days, it can be commercialized. So in 100 uh, private labs, um, such newly developed diagnosis kit was used. And um, privacy and uh, infectious disease prevention law were enacted, um, although that brings about some controversy. Um, we were able to swiftly respond to COVID-19. Of course, we have to also think about co uh, privacy issues, but still, uh, my point is that with legislation and with uh, institutional preparedness, we can respond to such disasters more quickly. And that makes a huge difference, as shown in other countries which were not prepared and um, failed to uh, swiftly respond to COVID-19. And risk communication, which should be very accurate and consistent, is needed. We collapse in risk communication during MERS, but this time we were quite successful. Um, I think that's because the government has been working hard to promote risk communication um, based on the lessons learned from MERS situation. And also, um, the trust and belief was promoted about the government, so the public took, has been taking part in social distancing campaign and regulation. So, for the success of Health EDRM, 
um, not only the Ministry of Health and Welfare, but also other governmental ministries and agencies should work together. So in terms of approach for health ADRM, local communities should take a part in on the activities and also we have to establish the foundation for effective prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. And we also have to think about how we go forward from all types of hazardous events, including emergencies and disasters. And this requires a systemic approach to take account of the risks and capacities. And again, in terms of approaches for health at EDRM, WHO is committed to support the implementation of the HIHR and uh, um, the Sendai framework as well as the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. And WHO has been emphasizing how we can approach this uh, digester uh, based on such existing agreements and frameworks. The approaches from other frameworks and the approaches from health frameworks should be combined to provide holistic guidelines. And this diagram uh, reflects the concept. And regarding this, what kind of assessment indices based on SDGs, I mean, are connected to SDG indices, all should go together. So how we can make a contribution to SDG should be also taken into account in um, health EDRM. What's interesting for me is about a specific strategy for emerging, emerging diseases and public health emergencies. This is an additional one for Asia Pacific region only. This reflects the same day framework, but this one focuses on infectious diseases as well as emerging diseases. It has been emphasized in the Asia Pacific region and that's because we have been going through bird flu, bird flu and MERS and SARS. Beyond Korea, Vietnam, Singapore and Taiwan and other Asian countries have been quite resilient, I mean quite immune, I mean quite strong um, relatively compared to other countries. Why? I think it's because of this document. The suggestions in this document may have been helping, but I'm not really sure if this worked. I mean, I believe that this kind of effort and this kind of uh, attention helped in responding to COVID-19. And what kind of lessons we learned from history is this. Health security threats, especially emerging diseases, are inevitable. And next, what I like to put an emphasis on is still this. The global security agenda and the IHR and approaches to infectious diseases and other uh, initiatives in relation to health uh, should go together with ED, health EDRM, but I'm not really sure. So we have to make sure this um, goes organically and consistently with those existing frameworks. So we've been working on preventing and managing infectious diseases, but separate from it, um, Sunday framework and other frameworks were used for another um, disaster. But on the way forward, we have to understand that no country is free from disasters. So each nation has to make commitments and we have to keep the word. Each, each government has to make, uh, keep the promise. So the uh, further thoughts is this. So we set up an international agreement um, on Sunday framework, but did Sunday framework work in responding to COVID-19? That's half for me.
but at the global level, I think um, same-day framework may not work very well. And we have been questioned, like, are we out of the wood? We also have to answer the question. Many experts warned that the second wave will come in September and October, and some say that the third wave will come back in March and April next year. Then we still have to make sure how PDRM and Sunday framework should go together in terms of resilience and preparedness and resilience as well as um, resilience, prevention, and recovery. And what is where we have to start? Sunday framework and healthy DRM um, should work in one way or another. And what kind of roles uh, do those initiatives have? So not only the Ministry of Health and Welfare and other agencies and private sectors also think about um, these um, initiatives. Also, we have to beef up the cooperation as well. So for more integrated approach between global efforts, uh, we have to think about how we can connect health EDRM, global health security, UHC, and SDG. Not only COVID-19, but also other possible infectious diseases and digesters like MERS-SARS and so on and so forth, we have to be prepared. Pandemic, scale, global infectious diseases may come back, whatever it is. And so we have to be prepared for that. With that, let me wrap up. Thank you.